So my name is Sara Ali, and um, I'm with a group called Equals. Uh, we uh, provide instruction in uh, many different areas related to for English language learners and immigrants primarily. So citizenship, ESL, digital literacy, um, some kinds of um, job preparation kinds of um, programs. And I've been working with the library for many years now. Um, and I'm welcome, I'm really glad you're here. And I'm really glad that you're interested in becoming a US citizen. I am. I was born in America, so I was born a citizen, but my parents are Pakistani and they immigrated here. So I have parents who are immigrants who became citizens. In addition, my husband, um, he was not a citizen. Um, he was an immigrant. And now about 20 years ago, um, after we actually after we got married, he became a citizen. So I have a lot of experience with people becoming citizens. Um, the good news um, is that I understand from our other participants and students is that the process is going moving a lot faster now. Um, during the pandemic, it had slowed down a lot. And now um, a lot of students that I've worked with have gone on to become citizens. So that's great. Um, I see, I see Raj that you wrote that you're gonna file after March 22nd. Okay, so you're waiting to the to the point of the application. That's good. So so far, if I have folks who have not um, completed the application yet, I'm gonna talk about that process as well of actually applying and 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 um, share some thoughts and feedback about that. Um, okay, so we're gonna get going. Um, I let's see, and I'm just gonna say hi to I see, I see while here we have Raj, Shaima, SK. Um, so we have a few different people here, and I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen because um, because folks are at different language levels um, because you all came from a, a another country. Um, what I'm going to do, the reason I share the screen, is so that you can read along. So sometimes, and I'm going to try to not to speak too quickly. Um, but sometimes it's easier. Some folks are better at hearing and um, listening, but some folks are better at reading. So that's why we'll have the information that way. Um, if you have any questions along the way, um, just you can unmute yourself at any time um, and feel free to just ask the question. That's fine. You can interrupt me. I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. You can also write your questions in the chat box. And this program is going to go on for it's scheduled for an hour and a half. However, um, it's scheduled for two hours, but after an hour and a half, what I'll do is I'll close and then I'll open it up for like specific questions. So sometimes people have specific questions about their situation. Um, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I do not have a legal background. So what I will say is that I can answer very general questions. Um, but maybe not specific to that, this, that situation, but I'll try my best because I've had sort of a, a lot of experience with different people. Um, okay, so we will get started. Um, so in terms of the steps to the citizenship, okay, there are five main steps to becoming a citizen. Um, and becoming citizenship and naturalization, you'll hear that word as well. So becoming, be, becoming naturalized, becoming a citizen, it's the same thing. Um, and the first step is to be eligible. Um, so, and I'm just going to show you where I am. I'm on number three here. The first step is to be eligible. If I am talking too quickly, please say so. Um, I'm happy to slow down. Um, um, so that means that you meet the requirements to apply. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but generally it's when you've lived in the United States legally for a certain amount of time and you have your green card. That green card is very important. Um, so once you're eligible, um, and it sounds like Justin and um, Raj are going to be eligible sometime in the spring, um, the next step is to fill out the application. And um, the application, there's two ways to send it. You can send it, submit it online, or you can also send a paper application in the mail, in the snail mail, the slow mail. Um, so um, we'll talk more about that, but generally I do recommend doing it online. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that is soon. Um, the fee is still good. It has not changed in a few years because um, under the previous 
uh, administration, there was an idea to almost double the fee for the application. So it is seven hundred and twenty five dollars. Um, and you you pay that fee and on and you'll do it online and you can um, give your credit card there. So once you've submitted your application um, and I'm on number nine here, so just so you can follow along with me if you prefer to read. Um, if once your application is accepted, you will get a letter um, with a date for a biometrics appointment. Um, so biometrics appointment um, means fingerprints, so, and some other stuff, but basically it's fingerprints. So you'll go to an office and you're going to provide your fingerprints. If you get this letter, and often this happens, it's happening pretty quickly now, that's a great sign. That usually means your application has been accepted without any challenges or questions. So you're in good shape. So um, you'll have your biometrics appointment and that usually happens pretty quickly. And after that, some time passes usually. And then we're on number uh, step four, which is the interview. Okay, and that's the, big, that's the big thing after the application. And the application, filling that application out is also a big thing. We'll talk about that. Um, but um, on uh, number 11, you see, um, you'll get a letter and the letter will have a date for your interview. You'll also give your email address in the application and they often email that information to you as well. So if you, it's your email, that's great. But sometimes people, when they fill out the application, they um, give their um, like their family, their parents' email, or their child's email, or somebody else. Um, so just have make sure they're looking out on their checking their email for that date of the interview. Um, number twelve is that at the interview um, there will be an immigration officer. And you're going to have and they're going to have a conversation with you to see how well you speak and understand English. Um, I will say from the experience I've had. Um, OK, and I'm, I just saw a question which I'm going to answer in a moment um, from the experience I've had in terms of level of English. It doesn't have to be very advanced English at all. Um, there's um, some questions there that are. Um, there's some vocabulary and some questions that you can prepare for to, to answer, um, but it doesn't have, so if you if you feel that you're in, I've had many students with fairly basic English pass and become citizens. So um, so that's the, the good news about that. Um, and actually I meant to, uh, okay, well, I'll get back to that later. Um, so, um, okay, and, uh, so the other thing, okay, so now we're on number 13. So they're gonna have a conversation with you, the officer, and we're going to go through all of these steps actually during this session. So you'll find out much more what it's like. In fact, we'll do sort of a kind of a practice interview. Um, um, Raj is asking a question, um, do we need a lawyer to do this process or can it be done without? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, and I can tell you many people have used lawyers, but I have worked with many people who have not used a lawyer. So um, I, I'm not supposed to really give advice, you're supposed to sort of ask, but I'm just going to tell you based on my experience with the people I've worked with, which are many dozens of people, um, they have, they've completed the application on their own. Um, if there's something unusual, though, so if there's something where you may foresee a problem, then at that point, you know, that you answer a question and you see that um, that, that question is going to put you into some kind of um, gray area. At that point, you say, maybe I need a lawyer. But um, in my experience, I've had um, many people apply, people with many different situations. And um, so far, knock on wood, knock on wood, I'm a little suspicious, um, uh, superstitious. Um, uh, but most people, um, well, actually everybody I've worked with um, has never had a problem um, yet. So, um, so I, think it's expensive to get a lawyer. <laughs> so unless you, you think there's something very strange about your application, I think it's worth it to, um, to, to maybe do it on your own. But if your English is not sort of um, very advanced, maybe um, ask a family member or a friend or somebody who has strong English skills. 
Also, the library is offering a free citizenship class. Um, it's like a series. And I think they'll go over the application and how to fill out the application in that class. So um, that's something to take advantage of. Um, Justin is asking a question. How long is the typical time between the application and the biometric appointment? So this is the thing from what I've heard, and it's, it's this is anecdotal, you know, it's I mean, I can't predict the future, but based on the students I've had, it's fairly fast. It's a month maybe, or two months. So it'll, between a month and two months, that letter comes that says, okay, your application has been, is under review, and the next step is the biometric appointment. So that part can happen fast. What takes longer is, after the biometrics appointment, um, scheduling your interview. That takes, that. there's, there's a lag on that now. And I, I don't know exactly, but you know, I, the people I've, I've worked with, it's anywhere from six to nine months is sort of what I've, what, what folks have shared. Um, okay, so, um, so uh, now we're on number 14. Um, there it says, uh, most citizenship applicants will also need to pass a reading test and a writing test. I say most um, because there are some people, if you have, if you're old enough and you've lived in this country long enough time, you can uh, what they call waive that um, test, and you can you don't have to take it. But most people will have to. If um, basically, yeah. So if you're younger, I, I don't know the exact age. I'd have to look on the application. But um, if you're 70 and older, um, there's, you don't, you probably don't, but otherwise you do. Um, and the reading test and the writing test are things you can prepare for very easily. The nice part about both of those tests is that actually they give you a list, like you have a word list and you can study the reading and uh, we're going to go over all those you're going to actually see tonight, all the words that would be on the reading test and all the words that would be on the writing test. So it's, it's easy to prepare for that way. Um, okay, um, and then number 16, and this is an important one, is during that interview, the officer will also ask you questions from your application. So the application, um, we'll, we'll get into it, but it's a 20 pages long and they ask all kinds of questions about your personal history, your family, where you've lived. Um, those questions actually you'll try to remember the answers of what you wrote in the application because the immigration officer will often go back and review those questions with you and, 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 and listen for your responses and that they match what you, what you wrote in the application. So um, now we're on to step five, which is the oath of allegiance. So uh, number 17, that's the number we're at. But if so, if you pass right there and then, you'll go for your interview, right? If you pass and they'll give you the test, they're going to go through everything. They will tell you right there and then whether you passed or not. So you know, you get immediate feedback, which is really nice. And actually, some, some people have been, not only has the officer said, hey, you passed, but hey, four o'clock today, there's a ceremony and you can actually um, take your oath of allegiance at four o'clock this afternoon. So um, everybody doesn't do that because sometimes people wanna go another day and bring their family um, so and, and have a celebration, but that can happen. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you a little tip here. Um, the oath of allegiance. Um, I'm not sure about the vocabulary level here, um, but what does oath of allegiance mean? Um, and I just, and the answer is there in number 17. So an oath, the word oath, because uh, many of my students didn't know this word and it's not that common. We don't use it so much in English, but an oath is a promise to tell the truth. Um, and that's important to know because sometimes they'll ask, do you understand the oath of allegiance? And then the word allegiance, what does that mean? So allegiance means loyalty, loyalty um, to your, and in, in this particular case, to your country. So an oath of allegiance is a promise um, to be loyal, to tell the truth and be loyal to your country. All right. Um, now, does anybody else want to share their status? I, I only I know two people here, um, but if anybody else wants to share where they are, is, does anyone have an interview coming up? 
Does anyone have that? I don't know if you want to share if you do have an interview coming up. Um, and I'm going to assume that nobody has um, written, has, has completed the application yet. So I'll assume that for this purpose. Um, okay, great. So the other thing is that um, actually um, I've been teaching this for a long time and I will say that um, what happened was from teaching it, I actually ended up writing a work, making a workbook. So that's going to be my plug. So all the information, the materials that you're seeing tonight come from this citizenship workbook. And if you're interested in it, um, I'm going to, okay, I'm just seeing some other responses, which is great. Um, if you're interested in the workbook, you can get it on Amazon. I think it's $12 um, uh, and to buy. And that workbook actually has all this information, but it also has a complete hard copy of the actual application. So, which is a really good way because instead of just doing it online, what you wanna do is actually complete the entire application on paper, just so, cause it's gonna take a while to get all the information. You have to get marriage certificates and other kinds of information. So that has that in there. And um, so you can look, if you want it, you can search on Amazon for Citizenship Sara Ali. And also I'm just gonna put my website in there, uh, equals.org. You can go onto my website and there um, there's a link to this, to this workbook. And like I said, everything I'm sharing today actually comes straight, straight out of the workbook. All right, great. Okay, so let's talk about um, eligibility. Um, SK is saying my five-year residency will end August uh, 2023. Okay, so there's a little bit of time SK has before. Um, okay, so, um, so we'll start at one there. I'm gonna read that. Um, before you can apply for citizenship, you must first be eligible for citizenship. Uh, one requirement is that you are at least 18 years old. Um, there's some situations with children, but in general, 18 years old. Another requirement is that you've lived in the U.S. for at least five years, or you have lived in the U.S. for three years and have been married to a U.S. citizen for three years. Um, number four, you must um, be a lawful permanent resident and have a green card. So that green card is really important. Um, uh, a green card, I think you all know, I won't go into that. I'm assuming everybody here probably knows. If you have a question, just go ahead and ask the question about a green card, but I, I have a feeling everybody knows that. Um, a green card, so this is now gonna help with the application. The green, number seven I'm on. A green card has a nine digit A number and the A stands for alien. So this is the alien registration number and that's on the green card. Um, you will need that number, that number for your application. So that's why I mentioned that because you'll be, you'll be actually writing that on the application. Um, number eight, your green card also says the date you became a lawful permanent resident. That's also an important date to memorize because often the immigration officer will say, when did you become a lawful permanent resident? So it's good to, to know that date and have that in your memory. Um, your green card has your birth, date of birth as well. Um, so in the US, this is something that's kind of interesting because um, in most of your countries, and if you, if anybody wants to write in the chat box, what country, I know Justin is from India, but what um, countries um, you are from, go ahead and write that. Um, but um, in that, oh, Egypt, very good, great. Um, so it's India, great. Um, because in some of these, in some countries, most countries, the date is written differently than it is in the US. Um, and you can see, so if we think about the date today, and does anybody wanna speak? Can I, can I call on somebody? Can I call on Justin? Justin, are you available to talk? Um, if anybody wants to talk. Yeah, there, yeah. there you are. Okay, Justin, I'm gonna ask you. Um, so, Justin, um, can you tell me number 11, we're doing number 11, what is the date today in numbers? So what's the date today? Do you know the date today? Yes, uh, it's 2-2-2022. Two, two, 
That's right. So, and that's an easy, I uh, guess. So it's 2 2 2022. And we in the US, we put the month first, and then we put the day, and then we put the year. Um, so when you're, and the, only, and the reason I mention this is because um, in other countries, sometimes they put the, the day first and then the month. So sometimes it's easy to mix that up and you do have to write dates in the application. So just be careful to make sure you, you write it the way um, we, we see it in the US. Um, okay. Um, so uh, now, okay. And, uh, oh, Shima's from Egypt. Great. Okay, so we have two people from Egypt, at least two people from India. Okay, I'm curious if any other countries are represented in this group. Um, that's great. Um, so um, I, I am going to do a little vocab check right now, um, number 15, um, just asking folks if you're understanding uh, me clearly right now, um, and if you understand all the words everything I'm saying, is it clear? Um, okay, great, because if it's not, I can, I can slow down. Okay, awesome, I'm getting feedback that yes, you are understanding, great, excellent, thank you. Um, all right, good. All right, so now let's go on to the application. Okay, um, I'm going to um, go over this, um, what the application is like, and then I'll, I'll screen share the actual application and show that to you. Um, Number one, I'm at number one, um, the citizenship application is also called the N-400. So you'll hear people talk about the N-400 and that is another word or just for the citizenship application. Um, number two, it's also called the application for naturalization. So I might say citizenship application, but it's also called the application for naturalization or N-400. All of these are the same thing. Um, and there's a copy of the application in, in this workbook. Um, so number four, um, and this is, um, e this is advice sort of I have, um, even if you plan to submit the application online, which I highly encourage, submit it online, it, is, it makes it goes a lot faster that way. It is a good idea to fill out the application on paper first. Um, number five, you see there the application is 20 pages long. It's really long and it can take several hours to complete it. Um, and there's all this information that you have to find from different places. So uh, what I've done, I, I, I've sort of helped a lot of people fill out applications and um, we've done, done the entire thing with paper um, and just fill it out on paper and then we're ready to go. And then you can just open an account online and then type in all the information and you've got it. So that's good. Um, Raj is asking a question for me and my wife. Do we have to file one application or two separate? So two separate applications. Yep. One. Yes. So it'll take a while, but one for you and one for your wife. Yep. Two separate ones. Um, OK. And so the information you might need to refer to, um, it's good to have when you're filling out that application. Number eight is documents like you'll need your green card. You're going to need your current passport. Where, from whatever country you're from. If you have a marriage certificate, actually, you should have that. Um, even tax returns, they wanna know that you have that and your social security card. Um, so that, that's a lot of information. What um, a lot of people do is once they're, they gather this information and they have sort of a folder or a binder or something where they just kind of keep it all together. Um, number nine, um, for most applicants, there are words on the application that they don't understand. So I can tell you from doing this application with many people, there are many vocabulary words that I don't understand very well. And I was born in this country. So this is something because when you look at it, you can go, oh, my gosh, this is I don't understand this. I this language is too difficult. And um, I would say, don't let that discourage you. It's OK. Um, now I'm going to number 10 there. I'm going to say this is normal and you can learn what the words mean, but it, it is the vocabulary can be seem a little challenging, but even if your English isn't that great, it, it's still okay. Uh, Sarah, fine. can I interrupt? Please? Yes, please, please. Yes, uh, this is Sarah as well. So, oh, hi, Sarah. Okay, hi. nice to meet you. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. I uh, wanted, uh, wanted to ask about the marriage certificate. 
Uh-huh. Um, if it is coming from another country, uh-huh. um, what kind of, um, I don't know, at the station maybe, I don't know, what kind of uh, process do we need to have on that one, please? Yeah. Yes. So um, and, if you and have, also it is in a different language as well. Ah, that's where I was going to ask you. Yes. So in that, I th- and I, I don't remember exactly, I'm going to have to look it up, but I think for, so if it's in English, no problem, right? You just like literally take a picture of your certificate if you have the paper, right? And you submit and you can submit it online, you attach it online. But if it's not in English, sometimes you do have to, I think you have to get it translated. Um, so there are um, on the USCIS website, um, the US Customs uh, website, they they give the guidelines on, on things that need to be translated and, and how to go about doing that. So uh, there are times when the people do have to translate them. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask also about the tax returns. So if, if you're filing everything, uh, regularly, but you have pending amounts, maybe installments, maybe, uh, it's not fully paid. What's the status here, please? Um, so if you're filing and you're on target to pay, if you, if you don't have overdue taxes, um, then you're good to go. If you have overdue taxes on the application, there is actually a question about that that says, do you have any overdue taxes? And you would just be honest. I think that's the most important thing is say, yes, I do. And then you give an explanation. So that, and that's fine. Um, And, um, but if you're on in progress to actually pay it on, on time, then you're fine. Um, yeah, so that includes a payment plan that is agreed upon with the absolutely audience. exactly. Then no you're problem. good. That's right. Okay. And there's Perfect. no problem. There's no problem at all. Um, and I will say I've had um, students who actually in the last five years. So you have to be in here for five years before you become eligible. And then one or two years because they didn't have a job. I had one person. She didn't pay taxes. Um, so she had to, you know, she had to just write that in her application. Uh, no, I didn't pay taxes every year. I, and one year I didn't have a job and it was no problem. And they, they said, okay. So great. Thank you very much. Sarah. Yeah, sure. And please, anybody who has questions, feel free, um, to, to ask questions at any time. Um, that's great. Um, okay. Um, so, okay. Number 11. Now we are, um, so during um, the interview, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the officer is going to ask questions directly from your uh, citizenship application. And, um, and they will try to verify the information, personal information. Um, they will also ask you questions. There's a big section, and we're going to go over that section. Um, I call it the have you ever. So there's 20 or so questions that are have you ever broken the law? Have you ever, um, you know, have you ever not paid taxes? Have you ever, and these are questions um, to determine whether you would be a good citizen for the U.S. to make sure that you you follow the law. Um, and they, they ask in many different ways. And we'll go over some of those questions together um, uh, later on. Um, number 14, Um, and I'm circling back to this because this is important with the vocabulary, is you will also be likely asked about your allegiance to the United States. So there you see it says allegiance means loyalty, that you support the laws and government of the United States. Um, And we'll go over that section because a lot of the application, if you don't know exactly what the word means, um, it's okay, but there's one section which is the oath of allegiance, um, where you should know exactly what every word means. Because sometimes they'll say, do you know what it means? What is the right to, you know, will you, are you willing to bear arms? I don't know. Does anybody know what that means? Are you willing to bear arms for your country? Justin? Join military. That's right. Join the military. Are you willing to hold a weapon? Um, to defend your country. So there's some things because bear arms, I mean, you know, I have arms and my arms are bare. <laughs> there's, there's different things. So knowing the vocabulary for that specific uh, oath of allegiance is very important. Um, okay. And then number, um, okay. So number 16. So basically what I'm personally suggesting based on experience with students is that you fill the application out on paper. And once you do that, 
then we're on number 16 here. You can open up an online account with USCIS. Um, and the reason I say that is because actually that account with USCIS, and I forget, I think it's about six weeks, they allow that account to stay open for, I think, around six weeks. And if you don't go back and log on, they'll close it. So you might as well not even worry about opening up the account until you're ready and that your application is completed on paper. That, that would be my suggestion there. Um, and then um, number 18 um, is, so when you are creating your account online, you should have a cell phone with you. Um, as you probably all know, um, on many bank accounts, we do two-factor author um, verification to make sure you're who you are and they do the same thing. So you always wanna have your cell phone um, handy when you, when you go online to open your application. Um, you're also number 19, just to give you a heads up um, on what, what to do. Um, you will be uploading pictures of your green card and other documents. So um, it's nice because um, you can just take your phone and you can take pictures of your green card and your social security, and then um, you'll have to um, sort of mail it to yourself and then attach it and you can upload it. Um, so you can submit it online. Um, okay. Uh, any questions so far? So that's the application part. I went through, I didn't actually show you the application. We'll go through that later, um, the, the actual parts of the application. But right now, um, today is the idea is to just, is to provide an overview of all the steps. Um, so first was eligibility to review, second was completing the application. And now third, we're gonna talk about the biometrics appointment. Okay, in a little more detail. So um, number one says, once you've submitted your application online, you should check your email often. Um, you will receive an email. And the reason is because they're going to give you a date and location. And that date and location may be like just two weeks away. So if you forget, you may miss it. <laughs> they send it. They also mail it to you. But th there's a, a lag. It can take longer to receive it in the mail. So it's nice to just be able to be monitoring your email for that. Um, uh, number five, you must, it says it in the letter, but you must bring your letter that you get to the biometrics appointment. Um, and you'll also bring um, photo ID, your green card, um, your driver's license, if you have a driver's license and your passport. Um, and you should bring a copy of your completed application. It's, it's good to have um, with you in case they ask questions. You can refer back to it easily. Um, okay. So, um, so this group is um, not that chatty, um, but um, so I was going to do review and ask you some review questions, but I'll go, pa I'll, I'll move past that um, and we'll just go to the next part here. Okay, so after biometrics appointment, um, then, and I'm going to just read off um, the work, workbook there, number one. So if your application has no significant issues, um, USCIS will send you an email with the date and location of your citizenship interview. And that's congratulations, because that is great news. When you have that interview date, it basically means your application was accepted. So you're in, you're in solid shape, um, and that you just have to go through the next step, which is number three, passing the interview. And if you pass it, you will be invited to attend the naturalization ceremony and become a U.S. citizen. And I hope you all become citizens. That would be great. Um, so I'm going to do not say number, read number four. Are you nervous? Okay, so many of you may not have even started your application, so you're not thinking about that. But um, a lot of my students, actually almost all of them, are very nervous because once they, um, because the interview does have many different parts to it and people are maybe not as confident or comfortable with their English level and communication. And plus you're talking to this official officer. I mean, it's kind of very nerve wracking and scary. Um, it is totally normal to be nervous. Um, in fact, um, from what I hear from students who've gone, who've had their interview, the officers, knock on wood, it continues. They've had very nice people, 
very nice people who understand that you're there and your English is, you know, maybe not perfect. And um, they're very understanding. So I will say it, it, most people, actually everybody I've spoken to has had a positive experience. Um, the, and I say here, the good news, you can, preparing for the interview, it is important, you have to prepare. And there's quite a few elements, which we'll go over today. But really, if you do that, and you prepare, there's a very good chance if you're if you've got sort of a basic to intermediate level of English, that you'll do just fine. Um, so um, number six, I'm going to read that if even if your English is basic, you can focus on the vocabulary and information in the book. So, uh, and, and you don't, by the way, you don't have to use this workbook or anything. Um, it's, it's more, all this information is actually also online. Um, you can get it th there. So you can, but, um, the, but, but the point is there's certain vocabulary and words that you should know. And if you know those, you're, you'll be in great shape, but you don't have to go learn all of English <laughs> and be able to, you know, read, uh, you know, some fancy newspaper or something. Um, so now let's talk about the interview. Does anybody, oh, let's see, I haven't looked in the chat box. Okay. Um, if there's any questions so far, I don't know. Okay. So we're good. Okay. Um, so here are the parts of the interview um, that you have to pass. So number 10 there, the first thing is a conversation with the immigration officer and that's they're listening to you. So when you're talking and they're like, Hey, how are you? What's going, you know, how, how have you been that they're actually listening to understand that you're able to um, understand and speak English and communicate. Um, the second part is the officer, and it's actually part of the interview, they're going to give you a series of instructions, number 11, follow instructions. And I'm going to go over basically what those instructions are. You'll, you'll, it's, it's listed below. But so you have to be able to understand those instructions and be able to do that. Um, also part of the interview. Then number 12, my favorite part is the civics test. So, uh, and probably most of you are um, familiar and have heard about this civics test. It's a hundred questions, asks you about uh, the US, um, anything from government to history to geography. Um, and so you need, and they'll ask you these questions. They're going to ask you them orally. They'll ask you, you have to listen and, and give the correct response. And we'll go over what it takes to pass that civics test in, in, in a little while. We'll go over that in more detail. There's a reading test. Um, so what happens is they're going to show you, um, I think they use a tablet for this. On a tablet, they're gonna have a sentence and they're going to ask you to read that sentence out loud. And they're gonna listen and make sure that you, you're able to read English um, out loud. Um, if you have an accent, no problemo, <laughs> accents are fine. Um, even if the pronunciation isn't quite there, that's okay too. Okay, so um, basically they want to know that you can read it and that you're that it's solid. But if you have accents and and things like that, they're they're good. So um, so don't worry too much about that part. But it is important that you can look at the words and actually and and say them to the officer. Um, there's also a writing test and. Um, and like I said earlier, the words for the writing test are actually published by the USCIS. They're in, on the website, but they're also in the workbook. So basic, but you do have to know how to spell, spell them correctly. So you can study and they're a limited number. I'll show them to you in a little bit. You can, you'll be able to review all the words on the writing test. Um, and, but they will, again, they'll give you a tablet and a little pencil, like electronic stylus pencil. And they'll say a sentence like, Delaware is the smallest state. And you will be asked to write, Delaware is the smallest state on a tablet. Um, and spelling counts. Um, OK. Uh, then next, number 15, they'll ask you personal questions from your application. Um, number 16, I call that it's sort of separate. That's the yes, no questions. They'll add, there's a lot of yes, where questions on the have you ever that I was talking about before, where, um, where your answer will either be yes or no. So the nice thing is in these, these questions, there's about 20 of them. You don't have to say yes and explain anything. All you have to do is say either yes or no. 
Um, and then the final, um, I mentioned that earlier, is the oath questions from the application. So that is, um, and they actually have the oath of allegiance there written, um, and they may ask you to read some of those sentences and make sure that you understand um, what all the vocabulary is in the oath of allegiance. Um, okay, so um, I think that's that on that page. I'm just looking to see if anybody has any questions. Um, all right, let's see. And I'm just looking here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think, okay, so we have 10 people here today. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I don't know if anybody wants to volunteer. Um, I'd love to have a volunteer for this part. Um, this is the conversation with the immigration officer. Um, and uh, basically the idea is I'll be asking a bunch of questions. I'm actually gonna pretend I'm the immigration officer and you will be at your interview. So you can see really how it feels um, to experience this. Um, so if, just I'm putting the, planting the seed right now if somebody wants to, um, to volunteer and right now I'll um, go over what it is. Um, so number one, um, at the interview, the immigration officer will talk with you to see that you understand and speak basic English. Number two, this is what Americans call small talk. I don't know if you know this expression, we say small talk, which is friendly conversation. Um, so what we're going to do is practice that. Um, I would love to have a volunteer. So here are the questions. And it really, it's very likely this is the, actually what they're going to ask you something like this. Um, SK, Sarah, would you be willing? I don't know if you're... Sure. Oh, awesome. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, great. Um, all right, so if you don't mind, and if I ask you anything personal, you can just, you can pass, you don't, because we're in, okay. we're in a group setting. All right, so what is your first name? Uh, Sarah. Okay, great. And what is your last name? El Masri. Okay, great. And so now, um, and you can see on the, I hopefully you can see the screen there. So you're giving me your first name and your last name, and um, uh -huh. they want to know how well you speak English. So if you say my first name is, so if you answer as much oh, okay. as complete sentences, okay. it just shows them, then they're not going to pay as much attention to you. They're going to say, oh, this person speaks English. I don't have to test them. <laughs> right. So, so it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. right from the beginning to, to answer in as many in many words and sentences as you can. Gotcha. So, all right. So um, number 11, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing pretty well. Thank you for asking. Okay. Um, who came here with you? Um, my husband and my son, and they're supposed to be there, there actually on that day. <laughs> Okay, great. No, that's and that's what we're doing. We're just pretending this is perfect. Mm -hmm. That's right. You say, yeah, my husband and my son. Great. Mm -hmm. um, How is the traffic? Well, it went well today, except from uh, from that highway to that highway. It was a little bit crowded. Okay, good. So that mm -hmm. shows that you absolutely understood what I said. I said, how was mm -hmm. the traffic? You knew exactly. And then you said, even you talked about the highways. So mm -hmm. the officer says, okay, this person understands me. Um, did you have any problems getting here? No, it was pretty clear. I just used my um, my uh, my ways application over the phone, and we just found our way here. Excellent. That's great. Okay. Um, how long have you been in this country? Do you mind me asking? I'm asking a question off, Sarah. Yeah. You're English. <laughs> no, uh, I've been here for five years, and oh. but before that, I studied for my graduate school for five more years. So ten in total but not um, back to back. Okay, great. Yeah, no, this, your, your English is very strong, um, like you're fluent. <laughs> um, okay, great. Um, and then I'll ask you number 15, which is uh, how long were you waiting? Oh, uh, well, it was almost 30 minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't been outside today. I've been here with um, people interviewing people. How's the weather out there? It's a little bit humid, it's rainy. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's the summer here, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Depending on when your interview is, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, it's going to be summer, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. great. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, um, okay, and this is an important question, the next one, which is, mm -hmm. do you understand why you are here today? 
course, I'm applying for the U.S. citizenship uh, as well as my uh, husband and my son. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. that's um, a question um, my students have told me they ask quite a bit. They'll say, okay. why are you here? And so it is, it is good to have that prepared that yes, I would like to be an American citizen or, or as you said, Sarah, mm -hmm. that, you know, any, any way of saying I would like to be naturalized, I want to be a citizen, anything like that, that's great. Um, okay, I'm gonna say number 18 because many of the officers actually say this, which is you may be nervous, I understand it's normal to feel nervous and everything's going to be okay. Okay. Thanks <laughs> for reassuring. Great. Yes. <laughs> thanks it, for me. Exactly. But it, it, it has been a little bit nervous uh, uh, in terms of the process and filing the application and everything, but we're excited. Great, excellent, that's great. Um, okay, and then I will say, so number 19, I'm just gonna include that because it's very funny. I had a friend, he was from El Salvador, Walter, and he was freaking out to use an English expression when he just was so nervous and he was like sweating and he <laughs> and shaking and the officer, and he's a great guy, he, he passed. But, and um, so the officer actually said this to him at number 19. The officer says, don't worry, try to relax, take a deep breath. Oh my <laughs> it God. can help you to be more calm. So the officer was trying to tell, and Walter's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because he was so <laughs> nervous. Don't go that far. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, hopefully nobody here will, will be in that situation. But even if you are, you know that there are people who have, and the officers mm -hmm. know how to handle it and understand. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to ask you some questions. If you don't understand, you can ask me to repeat the question. Do you understand me? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right. So do you have identification? Yes, it's my um, uh, green card and I have also my driver's license. Excellent. Great. And the more you say green card, driver's license, that's great. And mm -hmm. sometimes they say instead of identification, they'll say ID, mm -hmm. right? And hopefully everyone understands ID um, uh, is identification. Um, okay. And do you have any questions for me right now? No, thank you. All good. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Thanks, Thank you Sarah. for being willing to do this. Um, no <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. It's very helpful, I think, to, to see it um, this way because it is a conversation. Um, all right. Great. So that is the part about the conversation and they're the small. And as you see, that was small talk, right? About the weather, about the traffic. Were you waiting? Questions like that. Um, okay. So the next part is following instructions. And um, so uh, I'll start with A there. It says the immigration officer will give you instructions and they're testing your understanding of English. Um, so you're gonna listen and follow uh, the instructions. And um, I, I can't see any of you right now, but um, what I'll do is I'll just say the instructions so you know what they are. But if you can see these, basically, um, I'd say the, most of the instructions, if not everything, is right here. Uh, so basically, if you can understand somebody saying all these things to you, and I'm, going, I'm about to repeat them, um, you're in good shape. So number one is please pick up your personal items. Okay, so they might say personal items. Sometimes people don't understand that, right? So personal item, right, is your coat, your purse, your passport, anything you brought, because what they might do is say, come from this, you're in this room sitting on this chair and they're going to tell you to come to another place. So they'll say, please pick up your personal items. So it's good to know what that means. Um, please stand up, I think we all know to stand up. And then uh, number three, I'm going to walk to the door. Please follow me. Um, and then number four, Please remain standing until I ask you to sit. So sometimes they want you to stand for a while and then they're going to ask you, but they're also testing you. So you stay standing until they ask you to sit. Um, and if you do something like you sit before, it, it's okay. They'll just say, okay, we, uh, I want you to keep standing. So don't. it's not too much to worry about. Um, please wait here, number five. Number six is, 
please follow me to the table or the desk. They might ask you to follow them. Um, please put your items on the table. And again, those are personal items. So like your purse or your passport, your documents, your application. Um, please be seated, right? Sit down. Uh, number nine, please hand me your documents. So hand me your documents. They wanna see, they wanna look at your green card. They wanna look at your current passport. Um, 10 is please read this sentence. So they're gonna ask you to read sentences. Uh, number 11 is raise your right hand. So you'll be raising your right hand. Um, and if you forget, it's okay, but sometimes they'll just keep it up. <laughs> and then number 12, they say, you can lower your hand now. So they'll usually say, okay, now you can take your hand down. So, but if you do it before, it's okay. They'll just say, put it back up. Um, and then number 13, I don't know the level of English in this room. So I, I, I know of a few of you, which is very high, but um, some of these are, it's good to know the vocabulary here. So please print your last name here, okay? So print, right? Print means write each individual letter, right? Um, and they'll say last name. Sometimes you hear family name. I know in other countries, people will say family name or surname, but here we say last names and if you just write your last name. Um, and number 14 is please print your first name here, right? And again, it's print, you know, one letter at a time, uh, clear. So it's very easy to read. Um, and then number 15 is please sign your name here, right? So that's your signature. Um, and then write and number 16 is write the date here. Um, and that's why I had said before to know the month, the order is month first, then the day and then the year. Um, so these, so just scrolling up and down, basically these are the vast majority of what you would hear are these kinds of instructions. So if you understood me, um, and what I said, um, then you're in good shape that way. Um, and if not, you just study, um, and then you learn that vocabulary. Okay. So now we are at the civics test. Okay. So, um, um, something, okay, I'm going to read this, but then I'm going to talk a little about some specific advice on this. But um, number one, the immigration officer will give you a civics test. Most people have heard about this at this point. I'm assuming that most of you have. Uh, number two, there are 100 questions on the test. Number three, you must answer six out of the 10 questions to correctly to pass. So basically, there's 100 questions. You should learn the answer to all 100. But at the test, they're going to give you, you have up to 10 questions that you can ask, uh, that they will ask. You have to get six out of the 10 correct. So that gives you some space there if you do make a mistake. Um, so we're going to go over the questions of the civics test. But um, what I'm going to say about this, what I found from many people is um, when they're applying for citizenship, they will start studying for this civics test very early, sometimes even before they complete the application. And I will say here, wait till you submit first step, send that application in. And then after the application is in, then you can start looking at the civics test because this is stuff that you're going to have to memorize. And um, you'll, you may forget it. I know I even forget it. Um, so you don't, I would say in terms of the order of operations, I would say application first, send it in, then you can start looking at this test um, and the questions. Um, the interesting thing about this test is most of the questions, the answers don't change. Every year, year after year, it's about history or geography. It's the same answer, it, it, but there are some exceptions. And I'm going to go over those exceptions right now because um, here, starting with number nine here, I'm, and I'll read these to you. These are the questions you can start thinking of where the answers change, because depending on who is on office and who is the elected official in your area, those, those um, answers will change. So when you have the date of your interview, 
Then at that point, you look up the answers, make sure you have the correct ones to this. So today, say if you learned all these answers, in fact, if we went over these answers today, they actually may be different by the time you are um, having your interview. So it's good to review on those. Um, so I'm gonna go over those quickly. The answers to all those questions as they change is actually on the USCIS website. So, um, and it's this link here. Oops, sorry about that. Um, but I've got the link there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's right there. Um, and uh, now I got to go back. Sorry. Uh, hold on a second. So that's that. Okay. Every, everybody can see the screen still, I hope. Um, but you can go onto the website and then you can um, uh, find out the answers. So, but I'll go over them right now real quick. So number nine, um, what is the name of the president of the United States now? So feel free, you can either, if you can talk or you can type it in the chat box if you like. So if you know, go ahead and type it in the chat box, um, but we'll go over those. Um, so the name of the president now, Joe Biden. Uh, number 10, what is the name of the vice president of the United States now? And that's Kamala. Oh, I got Rogers putting Joe Biden, Joseph Biden. Exactly. That's right. Um, and yes, great. And Kamala Harris is the name of the vice president. Um, number 11, I think most people here are in Virginia. What is Who is one of your state's U.S. senators right now? Does anybody know? So in every state has, Justin, do you know? Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Tim Kaine. That's right. Is one of the senators right now. Um, so, Justin, while you're there, um, do you happen to know your U.S. representative? You might not know that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and that's fine. And you can look that up. Um, so in Loudoun County, um, many people in Loudoun County, it's Jennifer Wexton is the name of the US representative right now. But there may be an election and she may not be. So you have to keep circling back and check. The way to check, by the way, is this website that I showed you before. There's a link, the USCIS website. You put in your, type in your zip code. So the zip code you live in, and then it will pull up the name of your representative. That's how you find out. Um, how many seats are on the Supreme Court? Um, so this is, an, an, any, I don't know if anybody knows. Um, uh, so normal, so there are, so there are nine. Ah, good. I was, I was sort of going slow waiting for an answer. Yes, Justin, there are nine. So there are nine seats on the Supreme Court. The reason this answer sometimes changes um, is because sometimes there's an empty seat right? When somebody steps down and they haven't found a replacement. So it can be eight sometimes. So this is a little bit of a, sometimes a tricky question, but if you go with nine, you're good. Just nine is, is really what it usually is. Um, number 14 is who is the chief justice of the United States now? So chief justice Robert. would be, sorry, Justin? Robert. Yes. Yes. John Roberts. So John Roberts is the chief justice of the Supreme Court right now. That's right. Um, number 15. Okay, so Justin, I'll ask you that question too. Do you happen to know who the governor of your state is now? Yes, um, he was inaugurated on the 15th. What's his, name? What's his name? He's the governor of Virginia. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking out. Oh, Raj put it in. <laughs> Thank you, Raj. Thank you, <laughs> he put it in the chat box. Thank you, Raj. It's Yunkin. That's right. So that's the name of the governor he, who just became, like Justin said, just became, it was just inaugurated. Um, that's right. And then um, what is the political party of the president now? Anybody know the political party? So Joe Biden, what party does he represent? We've got Two parties. Democratic. Democratic. Ah, yes, great. Democratic. And Sarah wrote Democrat. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, and then number 17, what is the name of the Speaker of the House of Representatives now? Nancy Pelosi. Yes. Very good. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. That's right. Um, 
Okay, so these, and this is all, of course, right now, like I said, this can change. And then the last question here is, which, unless you move, it, it shouldn't change, um, is what is the capital of your state? Richmond. That's correct. Richmond. Richmond is the capital of Virginia. I don't know if we have anybody who's not um, living in Virginia here. Um, so um, you can say your capital. If you if you know it, um, Sarah, I'm not assuming these are gonna be multiple choice questions, right? They are not no. multiple choice. No, good question, Sarah. Yes. Okay. So there's no there you would they're they're free response. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah, that's why. So this part you definitely you do have to memorize. Um, people do though. I would say you know in general it it comes after a while. Right now it may seem like a lot, but I think it, um, once you start doing it, and there's apps um, on your phone you can get to study also for the civics test that can quiz you, practice quizzing you. Um, so there's a bunch more questions, but I won't go over them right now. I'll go to the next part. But um, there's like I said, a hundred questions total. Um, so uh, these are some more questions um, and maybe at the end, if we have time, we can circle back to those. All right, so now let's go to the reading test. Okay, so you've passed your civics test, you've had your conversation, your friendly conversation, you've followed your instructions, you've done all of that. Um, and now the immigration officer is gonna give you a reading test. Um, I'm gonna start with letter B here. You will be given three sentences to read out loud. Um, letter C says you must read one out of the three sentences correctly to pass. So that gives you a lot of leeway actually. One sentence you have to read correctly to pass. Um, D, the immigration officer will listen to your pronunciation. They're going to listen to it. But like I said before, they have a lot of experience with people with very thick accents from all over the world, and that's okay. So don't worry too much. It's just that you have understood what you read and you can repeat it. Um, so here's the good part, um, which is letter E. The words to know for the reading test are listed below. So um, not that you, know, you can take a screenshot if you want, but, and, and this is, I just didn't have to ask, this is recorded. So this video today, um, our, our session is being recorded and the library is going to post it on their YouTube channel. So if you ever want to look back, you can do that. Um, also, all these words um, are on the USCIS um, website. So you can go to the Customs and Immigration website and they have this exact list of words. So you can see here, these are um, the different um, words and most of them, you, you, you just look through them. Um, but most of them you can probably um, practice a little bit and be able to pronounce. Um, so like number 41, Independence Day, Labor Day, Columbus Day, Thanksgiving. So the way you would practice this is sort of what I'm doing right now. Sort of read um, these words, say them out loud, and maybe be with a friend or a family member who can say, oh, can you maybe work on saying that a little more clearly? Um, and that would be great, you should be all right. Now, the way they'll test you, so this reading test is they're gonna give you sentences. So just showing you here some examples of some sentences. So number one there, let's see. Oh, can I ask for, Sarah, do you mind? Can I ask you to take a reading test? I don't mind. <laughs> okay, great, awesome. Okay, so Sarah, can you read number one? Yes, let me, okay. George Washington is called the father of our country. Mm -hmm. Great. The, okay. yeah. the president lives in the White House. Then United States citizens have the right to vote. Okay, so that's great. And you can stop there. Excellent. Thank you so much. So Thank you. you can see that these sentences, the words come right from the word list. Okay, so they're going to take words from that word list and they're going to make sentences out of them. And then you'll be reading those sentences and, and, and Sarah just passed. So that was great. Um, and, um, but if you do feel that you have a little bit of, you know, difficulty or whatever, just practice that, that would be the thing to do. Um, okay. And so these are just more examples of uh, reading. All right, now let's go to the writing test. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll just 
go through this. Um, letter A, so the immigration officer will give you a writing test. Letter B, the officer will say a sentence out loud. You will write what you hear. So they're going to speak it to you, okay? You're not going to be able to see the sentence, and you're going to write what you hear. Um, letter C, you must write one out of the three sentences correctly to pass the writing test. So again, you have some latitude. They give you uh, the ability to make some mistakes. So you have to just pass, um, uh, cor correctly write one of the three sentences to pass. Um, again, the word list is right here. So the words, all the words you have to know basically are right here for the writing test. Um, Letter E, which is important, is you should learn how to spell all the words on the list. Um, and I'm just going to tell you my friend Walter, who I told you about earlier, who was very nervous, is not great at spelling. And that poor guy, um, they asked him to spell, you see number 24 here is Delaware. So Delaware is a state and he just could not remember how to spell in Delaware. And he just kept right. And the, it was very nice. The officer said, okay, try again, Walter. And not quite. Mm, try again, Walter. <laughs> not quite. And eventually he did get it. But, um, but that tells you that it is good. You have to, you should know how to spell the words. Um, I, some of the words that are difficult for me, for example, number 38, independence is very hard for me to spell. For whatever reason, I don't know if it's an E or an A or I just have uh, trouble with it. So, um, but again, this is something you can practice. Um, you can have a family or friend, a uh, family member or friend say sentences and, and practice writing them, uh, typing them. Um, so uh, letter F, I'll just read that. The officer uh, may have you, I said it before, write the answer on an electronic device like a tablet. So just be prepared that it, it might not be paper and pen. Um, G, it is okay if your handwriting is not great. Um, so that's okay. Try to write as clearly uh, as, well, as well as you can, but there's they understand if your handwriting is not that great. Um, the officer just needs to be able to read the words. Um, and then um, I, I mentioned already about the spelling. So, um, so that's, so those are the words. And like I said, again, they are on the website for the USCIS. You can look them up there. Um, and you can see, I have it here, a link um, where it says what the, read, what the writing test question, uh, writing the words are for the writing test. Um, now cruising down, uh, it's very similar to the reading test the examples of the writing test sentences. So they're right here. So flagged, so I, and in this particular case, you wouldn't see it, but I'd say something like, or the officer would say the flag day is in June. And um, if it's a long sentence, for example, let's see, number four, I want to live in Washington, DC. Sometimes it takes a while to hear it and write it. They will repeat. And they and you can say, officer, could you please say it again? Or officer, could you please say those words a little more slowly? No problem. You ask the officer and they'll say, sure, I'll repeat it. So if you if they say it really quickly, sometimes some Americans, um, they speak very fast. If they do, you can just ask them to slow down and then take your time and write it. So that's something um, to keep in mind. OK. Great. All right, so the next part is, okay, so now you've passed your reading test, you've passed your writing test. The next thing is personal questions from the application. So you filled out that 20 page application, you submitted it online, and now they're gonna come back and ask you questions from that. Um, I am just gonna scroll to the actual application so you can all see it. Um, and then I'll come right back to this. Let me just do that real quickly and show you guys. Okay, so I don't know if this looks familiar to anybody, but this is um, this is what the application looks like, the N-400. Um, and it's got all these questions here. Uh, if you can see my arrow that says, enter your nine digit A number. That's your alien number from your green card. Um, they're gonna ask you about eligibility here that you're 18 or whatever the other, and then they'll ask you information about yourself. And, and like I said, this is 20 pages, but um, they'll ask for your social security number, um, obviously your country of birth, your date of birth, 
Uh, and I'm just going through it quickly just to give you a flavor for what this application looks like. It is 20 pages, so I'm going to go through it. I, I won't spend all the time on this. Um, just show you what kinds of things they ask. Contact information. They will ask you part five questions about your residence. So they want to know where you've lived in the last five years. So if you've moved a few times in the last five years, each place, you'll, you'll have to say what your address was and when you lived there, the date of residence. Um, they'll also, that's all for residents. They'll ask you information about your parents, um, then mom and dad. Um, they're going to ask you some biographic information, right? Ethnicity, race, height, um, hair color, eye color, things like that. Um, then if you, about your employer, if you have a job uh, or you attended school or are attending school, they're going to ask you about that. Okay, and then this part may take some time to fill out. The time outside of the United States. So some of you probably in the last five years maybe went back to your home country um, at some point, which is totally fine. The, the only thing is they have rules about how much time you spent in your home country in the last five um, years um, and how many times you went. So this is an important thing to fill out that you'll have to, and you'll probably um, maybe start thinking about that because you have to sort of remember, oh gosh, yeah, I was in Egypt and that was 2019 and it was May. So you'll have to go back and get this information. Um, but they will ask you, number one, you see how many days 24 hours or longer did you spend outside the US during the last five, year, uh, five years? Um, and so you'll have, and there are restrictions. I think you can't have spent more than six months um, outside of the US at a time. Uh, so, and if you have that triggers more questions. I don't know the exact thing. I can't remember, I, I have to look it up exactly, um, but you have to fill that out. Um, and then they ask you about your marital history. So they'll want to know about that. And if you've um, divorced or separated, they'll want to know that information. If you are divorced, they will also want to have the certificate um, that your divorce, the legal document that um, shows that you are uh, divorced. So there's all this information they ask about your children. They're going to ask about that. So you can see how this takes a little while to fill out, right? Okay, now I'm going Where to- yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt, please? Please, please. Uh, the number of days uh, stayed out of the country during the last five years, how does it impact your application? It, does it delay the, the, the eligibility date to submit the application? Or No. Yeah. No. Oh, I see. No. So the five years are continuous. So whenever you left, but if you went out and came back, that's, that's, that doesn't add to your time. So I'm not required to be inside the country for a certain amount of days rather than five years and going outside and coming back for trips. For example, I stayed outside for two months. Should I should I postpone my application for two months no. after the five years? That's okay. my question. Great question. I'm, I'm really glad you're asking this. That's right. No, you would not postpone. So if you went out for two months, no problem. So you just include those two months and that's part of the five years. So they don't care if you, it's only, if I, I think it's 180, I think it's, I think it's about six months. I forget exactly. I don't want to say the number and say the wrong number, but it's around six months, 180 days that if you are out um, continuously in a five-year period, actually that can affect your application, your eligibility. You can't even apply for citizenship. So there's certain times that if you have spent a really long time, say you spent two years um, in Egypt or something, then they will they can come back and say, mm, you haven't been in the US long enough. But if you go for two months, even if you've done it five times, you go for two months, then you come back. Then you go for three months, then you come back. As long as it's um, under, I think it's under six months. See, I don't want to say the exact thing. Yeah, I, have I think to look it's it under up. six months. I shouldn't uh, yeah. be outside for six months. Yeah. 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 I think that's that. It, that it is. And as long so, as it's that, yeah. yeah. So shorter trips do not push the date of the application whatsoever. Not, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. That, and I can say that confidently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah. thank another you. Question. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I have another question. Oh, no, great. Yeah. So the 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 
the green card expires in 10 years. Um, so it doesn't matter when I start counting the five years. So it can be after three years from uh, um, getting the green card. It can, I can start counting after two years, after maybe four years. It doesn't matter, does it? Um, okay, so let me understand your question. So from the date you get your green card, mm -hmm. yeah, so then I think from that date, the clock starts ticking, right? So Well, I, I started counting the five years of residency inside the U.S. a while after, maybe, but I, I kind of traveled in and out of the country occasionally, but the residency and moving to the US started maybe a year after the first date on the green card. Was ah, it? I see what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that I'm not sure about the answer to that. Um, um, okay. Yeah, because um, it's, I'd have to go back and look at the eligibility and that's where I have to be a little careful because I don't want to give information that's incorrect. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, let's see here. Um, there's something about you've been a lawful permanent resident. I'm just looking at the, um, yeah. So as long as, you, once you get your green card, you're a lawful permanent resident of the US. That's, I think, the definition as the green card. Um, but if you're in and out, you have to record that. So the idea is that you are, you've been in the country. But if you have gone abroad, that's where I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. We'd have to. Yeah, because I, I'm looking at the questions and they are only mentioning the last five years, the last five years, not the last seven years. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Only five years. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. That's okay. all they're concerned about. If before that you were spending time in Egypt, no problem. That's right. Okay. okay. Right. Now I understand. Thank yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, all right. Great. Um, so now I'm just going to cruise past. So this part was all about personal information. I'm going to go to the next part here um, just to show you, because I think some of you have not done an application yet. So this is a good way to just know. I'm just going to go back. Let me just go to those and see how long this thing is. I'm on page 10, page 11. Okay. Here we are. So um, this is page, uh, what is it? Page 11 of the application. Is See, it says part 12. And this is additional information about you. This part is what I call the have you ever uh, questions. And you can see because they all, many of them start with the three words, have you ever? So number one, have you ever claimed to be a US citizen? In writing or another way and the answer is either yes or no it's one or the other um, and you will go through this now you want to take time to go through this but if the answer is no and it's okay if it is but in general most of your answers 90 percent of your answers are going to be yes you're just going to keep saying yes but um like uh, let's see. And some of these you can see like number 10. Have you ever been a member or associated with the Communist Party? Right. So yes or no. So in general, you're going to say no to, mo to most of these things. I did have I have had people because they do ask, have you ever been a police officer? There's number 15 here. Were you ever a member of or serve in? You see 15? It says 15C police unit. So I have actually had two students who one in Peru and one in Afghanistan, who actually did serve in the, in the military or the police in their country. And they wrote yes here. So, but in general, most of the answers are going to be no. They might ask for an explanation um, for that, but just be honest and, it's, and, and that would be fine. Um, but there, there are a series of questions and here the vocabulary level is high. It's very high even for us, native English speakers who were born in the US, some of these words are like, what? They're legal, some kind of words. So um, if you don't understand every single word on this, don't, don't get too worried because usually what they're, they're not gonna say, do you know what a uh, detention, well, detention facility, let me see. Some of these words are very um, like, it's number 20. It says, did you ever enlist conscript? Okay, in English, we don't use that word. Like normal Americans don't say conscript. 
So they will ask, and by the way, they will ask you these questions. Um, so some the and there's a range. Sometimes the immigration officer will ask you three. Of, there's like 20 something of these questions. You see it goes all the way to 29 there. Um, sometimes the officer will ask you like three. Sometimes the officer, like poor Walter, my friend Walter, they asked him every single question. <laughs> they kept him and he just kept saying no, no, no. But the good news with these questions is even though the vocabulary can be very difficult here, they don't ask you, do you understand what it means? So that's the good part. And in general, they won't say, do you know what conscript means? And you'd be like, oh my God, no, I, I can't. That's okay. But the part where you do need to know the vocabulary is the last page. So there's all this stuff. They're gonna ask you many questions. Uh, it's going to be the last page. Wait, uh, where is it? Ah, uh, here. Okay. So these questions, 45 through 50, I'm gonna show you this. Um, these are the oath of allegiance. And remember I mentioned that earlier that you're going to take an oath of allegiance if you pass. And that vocabulary, you should know what everything means. So number 45, do you support the constitution and form of government of the United States? You should know what the constitution is, is the set of laws and all this, and you'll have time to prepare, but this vocabulary you should know. And on all these questions, you wanna say yes, 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 yes. So basically they're gonna ask you all these, have you ever questions? And you're gonna say no, 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 no to most of them with few exceptions. And then they're going to ask you these questions. Do you understand number 46? Do you understand the full oath of allegiance of the United States? And there you're gonna say yes. And that's why I mentioned know what oath of allegiance means. That's important. Oath means a promise to tell the truth and allegiance means loyalty. So those are the things to, to know. Um, and, um, but other than that, you know, um, and I did my, my friend Walter, I love talking about Walter and he doesn't mind that I tell these stories, but um, Walter is very much against the use of guns or weapons. Um, he had, there was violence in his country where he grew up. So they asked him this question number 48, if the law requires it, are you willing to bear arms on behalf of the United States? We talked about that earlier, Justin said it, carrying a gun or a weapon. And Walter starts making some noise about, no, I don't like guns and <laughs> like gun violence. So he's like, no, just say yes, you're gonna do it, you know? So he had a whole discussion with the officer, I, you know? But anyway, he's fine, he became a citizen. But, um, but my point is you just wanna say yes for questions number 45 through 50 and be able to recognize when the officer is asking those questions. Um, all right, great, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Raj is asking, is early filing acceptable at this time, like three months or, yeah, so I've heard that too, Raj, that people at four years and nine months, they apply um, already, I, and I, I'd have to look it up, I don't know um, exactly, I haven't seen the latest, because that does change, so I don't know if it is, but I've, I know that people in the past have applied three months before the five years for, for filing the application. Um, Sarah, uh, yeah. sorry, I, I try. Uh, it, um, I have a green card, and it's time for me to apply for the citizen. It's it's uh, it will be in May. Uh, I tried to access the application, and when I tried to fill the application now, it gave me error message. You can start in February 16, three months before the five years, and I and uh, I stopped at this point. I didn't continue the application. Oh, so it stopped. You were three months before the five years. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will be five uh, five years in May seventeen. Okay. Ah, and you tried so in February. Months before, uh, three months before it will be like uh, February sixteen. So when I tried to make the application last week, it gave me error message at this point, and he told ah. me you cannot continue. You have to start in February sixteen. Uh, start with wait, what February sixteenth or May sixteenth? February 16th. Ah, three okay. Then, then that three means that, that then you can apply three months before. Yes. Ah, okay. That's great to know. Thank you for saying that because I don't, sometimes they change these things and I don't know. So you're saying that actually when you go online, they will, based on the date you put in, they will tell you yes. that you're ready and you're, they're saying February 16th, even though the five year mark for you is May. So there's, yes. you have the three months. You can do it three months yes. in advance. Okay, great. Once you ask, yeah. 
once he asked me for the date of green card, I say May 2017, he gave me this error message. You cannot apply before February to 2022. Great. Okay, great. So that does give you the three months. Okay, so that should answer. Yeah, and Raj, yeah, we got the answer to that. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Because sometimes I don't know what's the latest. And it's, it's great if somebody's if you, that you have provided that information. Thank you. Um, oh, what is sorry. your Yeah, sorry. go sorry. ahead. Uh, I have a green card. And um, at the time I, uh, I have the green card, I have two children under 18 years. But when I apply, both of them will be under 21. Is both of them is above 18. So if each one have a separate application. Um, okay. I think I don't know the answer to that. You're saying you have two children? Yeah. Both of and them are they a separate 18. application? Uh, at the time for uh, applying for the citizenship, both of them will be over 18. Okay. So that's... At the time I get the green card, both of them is under 18. But now, after five years, both of them is over 18, but under 21. So I have to submit separate application for each one of them? Uh, you might. I do, that, I'd have to look that up. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can look it up because, if you want. It because in the application, you said that uh, one of the questions, are you uh, yeah, uh, that's older the problem. than 18 years? That's yes. exactly. All, all, all buses. Yes. So if they're both 18, that's just telling me that they're going to have to each apply separately as, but I don't know, there may be a, see, because I've been, I've, I've had this with uh, people with families before, and sometimes there's some exceptions with that, um, with the children, when it's your child and they're with the age, that's why I don't want to answer that for sure. Um, that would be something maybe because sometimes on the website they have that specific information, but I don't want to say the wrong thing on that one. Yeah, yeah I don't know. So uh, yeah, because also uh, uh, like when I apply for tax uh, for taxes each year, I the, the for, all of them they file dependent for me uh, with me. Mm -hmm. So now when they apply each one separate, they already didn't file taxes. They they uh, dependent on my application, mm -hmm. my tax there. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what, how they will, so how will be the application for each one of them? So each one of them have to go separately and file his application by himself, or I can do it and to be our bundle, the family to be like one application or something like that to. Yeah, I mean, so the first question is whether they have to file a separate applications themselves. Um, and I, that I don't know the answer because they are 18, once they're 18, I don't know. I think that does change things, um, but I don't, I don't know for sure, because there's something with being a parent. When you're a parent and you have a child and they get to a certain age, I had, I don't know, that I don't know. Um, but you can help them fill out their application. I can tell you that much. I mean, that's no problem that, you know, you can just do it with them if they have to file separately. I'm just looking. Yeah, there's something about children and I have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that at the time for like, biometric or for interview, each one will be separate or will be together when we, when we apply as a family or? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, that, that one, I don't know. I'd have to, I, yeah, I'd have to either look online or something. That's, yeah, that, that question, the answer to that must be there at the USA. Some of these specific examples, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember. Um, yeah, but if, you know, if you email me though, I can try to look it up for you here. I'm going to just put uh my email in the chat box uh, okay. uh that's my email equals 411 at gmail.com if you email me i'll try to look it up and then what i will do is if i can find the link to this page where they stay explain that you know what the age at what age you have to do it individually as a child i'll, I'll send it to you okay i can do that yeah Thank you. Um, okay um Okay, great. So um, let me, let's see, let's, let's go back a little bit. Okay, so now um, we've got about a half an hour left. Um, I can, okay, so why don't I, I'll just continue for a little bit longer if this is um, uh, just to explain the rest of the interview, and then we'll open it up for other questions like that if, if, if people have questions. 
Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Let's go here. Um, okay, so personal questions from the application. Um, so I, you saw the application. So from that application, the officer is just going to, they probably won't ask you every question from the application, but they will ask you some questions. These are the ones, these questions here are the ones they typically ask. So they may ask other smaller questions, but generally it's these questions. Um, I, let's see, um, I would love a volunteer. Can I ask um, somebody to volunteer to answer these questions? Anybody wanna do that? Um, um, if not, I'll just ask the questions. Um, okay, so basically very often these are the, they'll say what country, number one, what country are you a citizen of? The, this, I have the sample answers there. And the reason the sample answers are there are because, as I mentioned earlier, you want to answer in as complete sentences as possible to show that you have a, a, a strong command of the English language, right? So if they say, what country are you a citizen of? You can say Egypt, or you can say, I am a citizen of Egypt, which will be a little better. Um, and what is your date of birth? You would say, my date of birth is... Um, and, and state that. Um, when did you move to this country? So there's a good chance they will ask you when you moved. Um, so you wanna have that ready, know this. So this information you wanna have in your mind so you can very quickly and easily answer the uh, questions to the officer. Um, when did you get permanent residency? Um, they might ask you and that's the date on your green card. Uh, number five, are either of your parents U.S. citizens? So you would say that. Number six, where are you currently living? So some people, most people know their address, but some people don't remember the zip code or they moved to a place very recently and they don't. So just try to memorize my address is and just be able to say your whole, your full address, including your zip code. Um, how long have you lived at your current address? You don't have to give the exact date. So sometimes people are like, oh, I moved in June 2019. You can say I've lived there for about two years or about three years. Just have it match your application. It should be the same thing that you wrote in the application uh, um, should be what you say. Uh, some people, actually a lot of people I've worked with um, have lived at more than one place over the, the previous five years. So they do have to answer that question and think about, oh, I, you know, not that I've lived there the whole time, but for a certain amount of time. Uh, number eight, you often get asked that, are you working? So are you working, doesn't mean are you working this minute, right? It means, are you working in general? Do you have a job, right? So they might ask that. So you can say, yes, um, I, I'm working. Or, or no, I don't have a job, but if you're just saying, if you're a mom at home, you know, with children, that's a job <laughs> and it's a good idea. You can sit, tell that to the officer say, you know, no, I don't have a job, but I do take care of my children at home. And that shows also that you are part of society, right? That you are a parent, you're raising children, you are, this is what we do in America. We raise families. So um, it's good to say that um, versus just no. Um, where do you work currently? Um, I don't know about the English level here, but everybody should know what currently means, right? Currently means now. Where, where do you live? Where do you work now? Um, and then have you left the country in the past five years? Have you taken any trips that lasted six months or more? That's that question. Um, and then when was your last trip? Oh, yes. So when was your last trip outside the U.S.? So they may ask you this. So you might just try to remember, oh, okay, you know, I was in India in 2021. So you might want to say, oh, I was in India in November 2021. But remember when that last trip was. Um, why did you leave the country? And, you know, I wanted to see my family or, you know, vacation, whatever you want to give. Um, they may ask your marital status, um, whether you're currently single, married, divorced, or widowed. Um, have you used any other names? So some of us like, um, like uh, may have a nickname, 
Uh, so if they, if you have another name, you say, okay, you know, my name is Sarah, but sometimes people call me, I don't know, uh, snowflake, you know, or whatever. My friends call me this. So something like that. Um, some of you may have this situation. Number 16, do you want to legally change your name? Um, so I've had quite a few students who, for, for whatever reason, either maybe they got divorced or um, uh, they wanted to pick a name that's more uh, American sounding, um, that they do want to change their name. So if you do, you, you will respond, yes, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And then do you have children? So those are the kinds of personal questions. Um, and then back to the the next part, which is the yes, no questions, which I um, talked about earlier when I showed you the application. Um, and in general, you will just, uh, I'll just give you some examples. Number six, because uh, I think Sarah had asked a question about that. Do you owe any overdue federal, state, or local taxes? So as long as you're on a schedule to pay, no problem, you don't. You don't have overdue. Overdue means that like you're, you should have paid it by now and you didn't. Um, and then um, there's a lot, and this is 20 questions um, on your application, but, and like I said, some of the vocabulary, like for example, number 11, have you ever advocated? So advocated is kind of a, a hard word, but like, have you ever supported either directly or indirectly the overthrow of any government by force or violence? Um, and in general, most of your answers are going to be no. So so that's that. Um, so those are that. And then once you pass those questions, you, like I said, you will have your um, questions for the Oath of Allegiance. Um, and what the sentences that you're going to say are actually in the application. I think it's on the last page, or I think it's the last page of the application has what you will um, say. And as I said, you should know what all those words mean. Um, and then, so that's it. So that's basically the process. Um, I, you know, does anybody have any questions at this point about any of the parts of the process? Um, anything? I have a question, please. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, I heard before submitting the application, like the last year out of the five years, we shouldn't be traveling outside the country. Is this still a law? Um, that I have not heard. Um, and I just anecdotally from a story, I mean, Lucy, uh, somebody who just passed, she was, uh, she just became a citizen. Uh, she's from Peru. And she was in November, she just became a citizen on December, I think it was, but she was in Peru in the fall. So she had been there, she had left the country within the last mm -hmm. six months. So I don't so know, unless something changed we are able to travel so so she just she just has her citizenship and she left the country she had been out of the country within six months before her interview yeah okay what she happens did. after submitting the application are we able to leave are we not able to leave until uh we finish the entire process we're discussing here uh, a total of a year, maybe you, you, you almost a year until everything is done between you, you, you mentioned one or two months be, between the application and the biometrics, six to nine months until the interview after that. So that can be 10 to, I mean, eight to 10 months. Ah, okay. So you're talking, leave. that's right. Oh, it's interesting what you're saying. So you're saying because on the, in the application, you talk about the previous five years, but then after you've submitted the application, there's this time period. Um, right. That I don't know the answer to actually. Um, I don't know what, what restrictions there are. If there are, um, I mean, I know you can't go over six months at a time, but other than that, I don't know that there's a restriction Right. Once you've submitted, I've never heard of that. Where once Do you've you submitted, think we the, can we can find that on the USCIS. That I think there. You, yeah, you might be able to find it on there, and um, and email me if you don't mind. If you want to email me and sure. remind me of this question, I'll try to look it up too. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Of after the application is submitted. Okay. Yeah, that one I don't know. Um, yeah, and then Raj, you're asking a question of what's the process if we want to choose a different name. So on the application, there's a place that says um, 
you know, do you want to change your name and what do you want it to be? Uh, it's somewhere here. Um, so there's a place on the application that you can do that. Uh, they make it actually quite easy for you that way. Uh, I'm trying to look and see what they say. Uh, this is, sorry, um, family name here, number four here. So this is, I think like the second, what is the second page of the application it says number four, name change optional. Um, would you like to legally change your name? So here you would say, yes, I would. Um, and then you just put in what name you want. So then you just write your whatever name that you want. Um, uh, somebody I just worked with, he, he actually just added a middle name, Chris, because his name is very long and he wanted a, a short name. So he just put in for a middle name. And then, as I said, a, a, another person, she got a divorce. So she wanted to go back to her maiden name. So she changed her family name from the old name to uh, the name that she had when she was growing up. So, yes, you can do it there. That's the, that's the spot for it. Um, OK, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, any other questions? I'm just going to see if I. Uh, yes, please. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when I start to file my application, uh, I will uh, start for myself till the end. And after that, I will open another application for my wife and then for my son, for my daughter or through the application. He will I will I can apply for my wife, for example, because we are joined in the tax return and something like that. Yeah. So from what I've understood from people who've done this is it's complete. It's separate. You'll, she'll have to create a separate account. So you'll apply and you're one individual and she'll have to apply completely separately. Yeah. So you'll have two UCIS accounts, one for you and one for your wife. Okay. And it looks like it will be also for my uh, children because both of them is over 18. Yeah. So that's the one I don't know exactly because when it's children, but it, it very likely if they're over 18, they're going to have to create also their own accounts and have their own separate application. But I don't want to say that for sure, because I don't know sometimes there's exceptions with children. So I don't know all the, all the rules. Yeah. Okay. Your wife and you will have to apply, have separate applications. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And when I apply for on, uh, online for each of us, uh, like, can I have the same email for all of us or it will be a problem when creating an account? So I have a, have a separate email for each one. You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, because to follow, I, I yeah. just need to follow. Because I, I any, receive any, uh, like, uh, reminder, any appointment or anything I have, I need to. Yeah. Uh, you may, that may be one of those things you try um, to give the same email and they'll probably say, uh, you can't do this. This email is already being used, registered to another applicant. Um, in which case you'll have to create an email for your wife and your kids and yeah, or if, yeah, and they'll have to, or have some mechanism where they forward the email to, to, into your account, to your email. You can do that sometimes, but I don't know if you can put in four emails, like one for the same email for all four, family members uh, that you'll have to, t I guess, try <laughs> to see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah, any, so any other questions? This part, I'm sorry. So I, this is the one thing I can give a lot of general information sometimes for the specific stuff. That's where it gets, um, because the, the laws change. Um, I have to be very careful. You know, all this doesn't change, so it's easy. <laughs> but these certain things do, and I don't want to give incorrect information. That's why I'm a little careful there. Um, so, um, okay. So, um, so if there aren't any more questions, um, I'm just sharing this last uh, page with you, which is um, preparing on your own. Um, what you can do. So the next step would be number one, fill out the citizenship application, the N-400. Then, you know, hopefully on paper as, but it's up to you, but that's what I would recommend. Number two, create um, an online account with USCIS. Um, and you can do that. And then, then after that, start, you can start studying for the civics test and learning those answers and the vocabulary you don't know. 
And then you can start looking at the words on the reading test um, and then practice writing sentences for the writing test. And then there's some links here where you can, um, you know, do more practice online. And there are YouTube videos. So there are YouTube videos where you can see examples of citizenship interviews happening. So, and again, that's, that's a far away, it's not gonna happen that soon. Um, and um, put all your documents together, number 10, um, and have them together for your interview. Because for your interview, you wanna have all your documents and make sure you remember to bring them. And, um, and that's, and practice asking yourself questions from the application. So, so yeah, so that's basically the process. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and um, is there anything else, any other questions I have? That's basically the process for um, applying and becoming a, a US citizen. Thank you so much. Sure thing. It was my pleasure, Justin. Yeah. And thank you all for joining today. I hope it was helpful and valuable. And as I mentioned, the library is having citizenship classes um, in a series. So and I think they're online. So you can sign up for that as well. And that's once a week for like seven or eight weeks, something like that. So that's thank an option. Thank you very much, Sarah. OK, thank great. You. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. All right. Have a good rest of your evening. OK, good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.